describe it that way, even though it doesn't come close to meeting any of the definitions. <laughs> but then look at things that uh, Nidal Hassan actually cited as far as what motivated him to go and engage in this act. He talked about, in his diaries and elsewhere, things that the United States was doing in Afghanistan and had done in Iraq. For example, we went into Iraq and created a name for the tactic that we used in the first week, which is extremely appropriate, called shock and awe. And the reason it was called that, it was because it was designed to shock the civilian population into submission, to terrorize the civilian population of Baghdad into submission so that we could advance our political ends, which was to take over Baghdad, change the regime, and install the regime that we wanted. Or look at what the United States did both in Afghanistan and Iraq that Hassan cited as well, which is in Afghanistan in 2001, we targeted an Al Jazeera office um, in the northern part of Afghanistan in December of 2001, which the journalist Ron Suskin had said, based on interviews with a whole variety of top-level sources, was a deliberate act of targeting Al Jazeera, and we obliterated their building. And then a year and a half later in Baghdad, we did the same thing. We targeted an Al Jazeera office with a cruise missile that was shot from a fighter jet and that killed one of their journalists as well. And a British memo, from, a memo from British intelligence was unearthed in 2005 saying that Tony Blair was told by George Bush that targeting Al Jazeera was a deliberate strategy of the United States. So here is the targeting, not just of civilians, but of civilian journalists by the United States, the deliberate terrorizing of civilians in Baghdad, the same thing in Fallujah, that far more approximates the classic and, and formal definition of terrorism than anything that al-Hassan did. And yet, if you were to apply the term terrorism to the United States in terms of what it did in the events that I just described, you would be immediately marginalizing yourself. You would be deemed crazy or radical or anti-American or hateful or, or any of those other terms even though you're doing nothing but taking the formal definition of the term and applying it as faithfully and consistently as you can because the biggest taboo in the United States is to take the term terrorism and apply it to things that the United States or its allies do. That is by definition what the term isn't. There's a lot of other examples as well. I just want to touch on a couple. Um, just last week, there was one of the media's favorite events, which was a huge terrorism scare when two packages were found allegedly containing highly sophisticated explosives that were sent for Yemen and were intended to apparently detonate in midair or arrive in the United States. And every media outlet, every politician who talked about this incident described it as an act of terrorism. And that's probably appropriately enough if you look at what the classic definition is. There probably was indiscriminate targeting of civilians for violence in order to advance political ends. But what was missing from that story in virtually every media account, and go and look at them and you'll see that this is true, is the events that preceded that attempt, that actually caused it, which was in, the, in December of 2009, Barack Obama sent his own bombs over to Yemen. He didn't use the postal service, he used submarines and, and fighter jets. Um, <laughs> but nonetheless, we sent bombs first to to Yemen, and, and some of those bombs actually contain cluster munitions, which are some of the most inhumane weapons that exist in the world, because what they do is, prior to impact, they scatter as far as two or three miles away. They don't detonate until there's contact with them. And typically, the contact is made by innocent people, usually children, playing in a field who find this and pick it up, thinking that it's some interesting object, and then it explodes and kills them and everybody around them. And so civilized nations don't use cluster bombs. The United States did on this cruise missile that we know for certain killed at least 55 innocent civilians, including women and children in Yemen at the end of 2009, which is what in turn led to so many people in that country, which hadn't really been a source of US targeted terrorism for quite a long time, deciding that the United States was a threat that they would support terrorists who wanted to lash back at the United States, who wanted, who were willing to either be recruited by or lend support to terrorists in Yemen. And this part of the story, the fact that Barack Obama authorized cruise missile attacks that we knew for certain would result in the death of all kinds of civilians, and yet we did it anyway, is never part of this story. So the tale of terrorism is completely one-sided, even when the term is used fairly, which is it's something they do to us, but never something 
that lead you to them. Um, a final example that I want to mention here um, is that there was at Guantanamo just two weeks ago uh, the conclusion of a military commission, not a trial, but a military commission, a military tribunal. When George Bush created this system, it was uh, a matter of great controversy and scandal among Democrats when Barack Obama continued it um, and is now per perpetrating military commissions on detainees at Guantanamo. It's not nearly the same level of controversy, so most people don't know about it, but it actually still continues. And there was just one that concluded of a defendant who, at the time that we abducted him from Afghanistan, was 15 years old. This, his name is Omar Potter, and he was the first child soldier that the United States has tried for war crimes in its history. A war crimes trial of a, of a child, someone who was 15 years old. And what Omar Khadr was accused of doing, what he was labeled a terrorist for, was he was in Afghanistan at the time that the United States invaded. And there were military units, American military units, ironically enough, occupying what had been Soviet outposts, the outposts that the Soviet Union used when it occupied Afghanistan to the great consternation of the United States and we funded the very people that were now fighting over there. They were occupying Soviet outposts and Omar Khadr took a grenade and threw it, not at any civilians, but at the invading force in Afghanistan, and it exploded, it killed one of them, and it blinded the other. So that act of taking a grenade when you're 15 years old, when you're in a, your country, and an invading force invades and then starts to occupy it, throwing it at an invading force, that is terrorism, as we understand it. And it justified abducting him, putting him in a cage in Guantanamo for seven years without charging him with any crime. But the preceding act, which is the United States invading that country, bombing huge numbers of wedding parties, killing lots of civilians. In the words of General Stanley McChrystal, the war commander in Afghanistan, that we have shot an extraordinary number of people at checkpoints who it turned out had done absolutely nothing wrong. None of those acts of civilian slaughter over the course of 10 years aimed at civilians could ever be described as terrorism. There are lots more ex of examples. Since 9-11, obviously, terrorism has become the central justifying weapon that the US government uses for virtually everything that it does. And what's amazing about it is that it's literally a term that has no meaning. And what I think is most interesting about that concept, how clear civil liberties is, how unclear terrorism is, is that what we have is a term that has no meaning that is completely subject to unlimited, unlimited manipulation, the term terrorism, that is being used as a central instrument to erode and degrade and ultimately demolish this term, this concept that was really intended to be crystal clear, which is civil liberties. So you have a term that has no meaning obliterating a term whose meaning was intended to be enduring and is in fact crystal clear. And that, I think, is quite unique in, in our history. I mean, you can look at, back at times when civil liberties have been degraded by presidents. But usually those threats that were used to justify those infringements, at least they had a fixed meaning. I mean, Abraham Lincoln, during the Civil War, suspended habeas corpus illegally and unconstitutionally, but there actually really was a civil war. It had a beginning and a middle, and we knew it would have an end. During World War II, Franklin Roosevelt interned disgracefully Japanese-American citizens without due process, but he did so in the name of a war with Japan that really was real and that had a beginning and a middle and we knew it had an end. And even the McCarthy abuses at least were justified in the name of a country that actually existed, the Soviet Union, and in the name of an ideology that we could understand, which was communism. So as disgraceful and dangerous as those acts were, at least the pretext that was used had a fixed and understandable meaning. As opposed to now, when a term that is completely amorphous, that has no controlled definition whatsoever, and that is therefore subject to limitless abuse, and that will endure for as long as we need it to endure until there's some other threat that we can use more effectively, that is the weapon the head point of the arrow that is being used to destroy our fundamental liberties. And that, I think, is unique in our history and, and unprecedentedly dangerous. So that, to me, is, is really what has to be understood in order to understand the interaction between terrorism and civil liberties. And then to understand how this dynamic works, the interaction between civil liberties and terrorism in the age of Obama, which is the topic that we've chosen for this event, I think it's necessary to first begin with that concept, terrorism and civil liberties in the age of Bush. And that only then can we understand 
how those terms are, are interacting in the age of Obama. What's, what's most interesting to me is that when I first began writing about political issues, it was in late 2005, and, and as you heard in the introduction, I had been practicing law, constitutional, and civil liberties, and had decided, in essence, that the threat posed by the radicalism of Bush and Cheney to our Constitution and our civil liberties was so great that I no longer wanted to work on a case-by-case -case basis in the confines of courts, defending those rights on a one-by-one -one basis. I wanted to have a greater impact, and I wanted to do something that would enable me to try and sound the alarm and alert my fellow citizens about how radical and extremist this threat was. And when I first started writing about these things, there were very, very, very few people who were actually writing about those things in a meaningful way. There were some, but there were very few, and there were almost none with any kind of substantial platform. And my expectation when I first started writing about them, and I confess this with some degree of embarrassment because it's so naive and turned out to be so baseless, is that there would be allies in that effort to be found among conservatives, people on the right. Isn't that amazing that I actually thought that? But the reason why I thought that in defense of myself is because those were the people who had actually spent so long proclaiming that they were the defenders of limited government and constraints <laughs> on federal power. So I thought if anybody would be concerned about things like unlimited eavesdropping on American citizens by the executive branch or the ability to put American citizens on American soil in cages with no trial, it would be the self-proclaimed champions of limited government. I mean, isn't that ultimately, in my defense, a pretty reasonable <laughs> assumption? <laughs> And you know, the, what, what, what else was true um, in, in my defense is that if you look at the debates in the 1990s under the Clinton administration, 